All right, so it's a pleasure to be at this great event, honoring Research Corporation and uh, other uh, beneficiaries of uh, science. So I'm gonna mostly talk about scientific results that came up from the support from RCSA, but uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the outline, what happened, how this helped my career, and so on, somewhere in the middle of the talk. What I'm trying to do in my research is uh, to model evolution of galaxies and their gaseous halos. So this is somewhere completely outside of what we discuss today because this is probably the only talk where we cannot do experiments. We have to do models and we have to use those models to interpret what we see on the sky. So a couple of basic stuff that we know about the universe is that the universe keep forming stars since the earliest time, somewhere a few hundred million years after the Big Bang all the way to present, so about 14 billion years from the Big Bang. And this is shown in this plot that kind of shows how many stars form per year per unit volume of the universe. So there were not that many early on. Things peaked about 10 billion years ago, but we are still forming stars. So what's interesting is that galaxies changed completely in that time frame. First, of course, they didn't exist. The universe was super smooth. It only had these tiny, tiny fluctuations in the matter power spectrum. So it was almost completely uniform density. Then after some time, galaxies form and they look like mass. There were these clumps and wiggles and there were completely weird and chaotic looking objects forming stars like crazy. Over time, they increased their mass. They kind of started to come down. And by present time, we often see these really nice looking disky galaxies that looks like almost perfect disk with nice spot line. So everything kind of calmed down over time. So what I wanted to know in my research and I still want to know it what drives the star formation history of the universe? Why do things behave like this? How do galaxies form? How do they pollute the universe with heavy elements? All of the heavy elements except hydrogen, helium, and trickle of other stuff are basically forming stars and then ejected out. And I would also like to know what is the effect of star formation on, on galaxies as they evolve and on their underlying dark matter. So this, the last question is kind of the key of what, what I actually do on, in daily life. So what do we need to do here? So we would like to know how to go from this stage, which is super smooth universe. This is kind of multiplied by 100,000 to see tiny density fluctuations when the universe was 300, 380,000 years old. All the way to present time, then now you see a clump that looks like this and another clump that looks like this. So density contrast is 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 or more with respect to the background. And the region that collapses into one galaxy that's tens of thousands of light years, it's typically a few million light years wide. And then we would also like to know what happens at these small scales where stars form, which are only a few light years large. So it's a huge dynamical range. It's really, really hard to follow, even with computers. And plus, we need to follow 14 billion years of evolution. So of course, experiments are out of the question. It'd be great to form universe in a lab, or even a galaxy, or even the star, but of course, it's impossible. So we use supercomputers that do this job for us. So we create fake universe, or I shouldn't call it fake, I should call it artificial universe, that then we use to constrain these observations and try to figure out what happened, how do we get here. So these models are super efficient in terms of computation, but they still take a couple of weeks or a couple of months on thousands or tens of thousands of computer cores to get one galaxy that looks like this. But you literally start from nothing and just use uh, forces that we know from physics that govern how, uh, how things uh, interact with each other, how gravitational force govern the collapse of the matter, and how gaseous forces cause the gas to heat and then to cool out and so on. So I'm gonna skip 75 steps and just tell you that these models that we uh, run over past few decades showed us that galactic growth mostly happens by galaxies eating the surrounding gas. So the gas just keeps coming from everywhere into the galaxies and they just keep growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And that's basically what fuels the long-term star formation. But if you leave galaxy to just keep growing, they end up being way too massive. We know that by comparison of regions in the simulation with the regions of the universe. So we know that something has to keep ejecting the material from galaxies. They just eat too much. And so these processes, the eject material from galaxies are typically called galactic outflows. They're a consequence of something that's called stellar feedback that regulates growth of galaxies. So what happens material to 
He literally ejected from galaxies. This is the hot gas in one of the nearby galaxies called Cigar Galaxy. And the red stuff is coal gas also ejected from that galaxy. It's a combination of supernova explosions, so the, that's the end life of the stars, and radiation from young stars. If they collectively act together, and you have a lot of these events, you can actually push the matter out. This more technical plot that shows absorption spectrum from some of the early galaxies. It shows that absorption from the galaxy, there's just a smudge, we cannot see the details. It shifted to the blue, meaning material from the galaxy is flying towards us. It's blue shifted in terms of Doppler shift. So we know that that galaxy is also spitting material out as we observe it. However, it's not easy to model this uh, stellar feedback because you literally need to know uh, what happens at the few parsec scales within galaxies. And you still have to do these millions of light year region around the galaxy to form them in the first place. So the big advancement came uh, relatively uh, in my early career here at UCSD, 2013, 2014, when I just started faculty position. We started something that's called FIRE project, which stands for Feedback in Realistic Environments with a couple of my collaborators. And our goal was to develop cell consistent simulations where we can actually produce galaxy outflow from almost first principle. So in order to do it, we use the fact that computers are getting fast. So at that time we were able already to do a couple of tens of millions or hundreds of millions resolution elements per one galaxy. And we could resolve scales where the feedback actually starts, where the star formation occurs. And that enables us to get clusters, events of star formation and stellar explosions. And some of these cluster events actually produce large scale outflows. So you can see them in this movie. When the movie started, that was very young universe. The tiny little proto galaxies were forming. They had super high density of star formation. And when those stars exploded as supernovae, they ejected a lot of material. As the galaxy increased in mass, star formation spread out to the surrounding region. And then you have like local puffs of matter coming out of the galaxy, but they're not able to go very far because the uh, depth of those gravitational wells is too strong. And the star formation is not that clustered anymore. So that's kind of the key how you go from these small chaotic things that we see in the early universe to these beautiful looking disky galaxies at present time. And these, by the way, are the products of this fire project. They look almost exactly like observed galaxies. And to produce these, we start from the super smooth universe early on. Just by using physical processes, we can actually get objects that look like this. So the key here was to use uh, resolution independent momentum from each supernovae that was missed in almost all previous generations that enable us to form small galaxies and big galaxies uh, that are looking quite realistic. So now, this is where the research corporation comes in. We had this fire model, it provided good match to observe distribution of uh, galaxy masses, of the heavy element content, dark matter profiles of galaxies, and so on. But early on, we wanted to do things fast, so we didn't really do the most risky stuff. And the most risky stuff was to actually have a couple evolution of dusting galaxies with radiation that's super expensive <laughs> computationally. And also, we didn't quite explore what's going on with the cosmic rays. Those are relativistic particles that just kind of diffusing throughout galaxy like our own and could actually be pushing gas much more mildly, but have long-term consequences. It's also both expensive computationally, but also theoretically not very under well understood. So in 2016, I got Cottrell Scholar Award, which was really key in pushing and making progress in those two areas. And with the help of TK Chan, a grad student here at UCSD, we started this development of the efficient algorithm for transport of these cosmic rays through galaxies. Fortunately or unfortunately, it took us almost three years to do it. So we started early and the methods paper got published last year. But the good thing is that we already make enough progress after one year, such that we could motivate much larger NSF grant for like a new generation of FIRE model that we call FIRE 2, including lots of work on the cosmic rays. And that brought us about $1.3 million for the collaboration and about quarter to UCSD. So that was really a key moment without it. We probably never, never even started this because we knew it's gonna take us years to do it. All right, so just a few slides about what these cosmic rays are doing. Cosmic rays physics is uh, relatively complex and it happens at small scales that we cannot directly resolve, but we can resolve how they spread out through the galaxy. 
this new efficient algorithm that we developed now help us test all kinds of parameters. And it turns out that those parameters can give you a completely different outcome for galaxies. Cosmic rays either hang out just within the galaxy or they can spread out to its surrounding very far from the galactic disk and start affecting diffuse gas outside of the object. And you can actually test which of these is correct by using gamma ray emission from galaxies. And gamma ray is the consequence of the interaction of cosmic rays with the interstellar medium. Too much terminology, I know. But the punchline is that by comparing two observations, we favor the, the one model where they completely diffuse out of galaxies and start affecting stuff that's far away, tens of thousands of light years away. So that turns out to be uh, very important because that help us now run back these large scales fully cosmological simulations when we try to produce galaxies from first principles, but now with cosmic rays. And this is the same galaxy with these different parameters of cosmic ray transport. And this is the one we favored. So instead of having clumpy colder gas around the galaxy and had this reddish medium surrounding it, the galaxy is surrounded by this warm, uh, green is warm in this case, about tens of thousands of degrees gas. So you might wonder, so what? That's tens of thousands of light years from us. Turns out that for about a decade now, people are finding that gas around galaxies that shows up in absorption from background objects is mostly warm. And people couldn't really explain what's happening there because most of us use these older models where we had just hydrodynamics, no cosmic rays. Now cosmic rays can actually help us this uh, long-standing puzzle of why are galaxies surrounded by this warm diffuse gas. All right, so uh, what are we gonna do next? Well, now we are using lots of details of this cosmic ray transport. We are trying to understand physically, uh, microphysics of their transport. We are trying to see how to get ob better observational constraints to really say which of these parameters is, is by far the best. And at the same time, with my group of grad students, we are pushing for improvement on this dust and radiation transport that I mentioned earlier. So hopefully that's gonna leave, uh, lead to more uh, future breakthroughs. Just wanted to come back and mention that this award from RCSA was really crucial for uh, my success at UCSD and success of my group because we would not start this project that looked like way out there. It takes three years, so I would just never start it. I would do something safe, just look at gas accretion in the galaxy where I, that I was expert on. The second of all, this uh, Cottrell Scholarship and RCSA in general just gives freedom to explore these risky areas. And cosmic rays were only a small part of my proposal, but you guys didn't really care if I was doing the main part or the side part. And that was actually really good because it, the payoff was much greater from this part. And also these Cottrell Scholar conferences that were mentioned a couple of times today are really developed in this close community and I met lots of uh, good people from a couple of different areas, not just in astronomy and physics. And finally, something that was mentioned, but only briefly, there is a big component in Contrail scholarship that stimulates development of educational methods and also incorporation of research into teaching. And I guess we, got just, we just got funding for a summer workshop on uh, implementing Python modeling in the science classes this summer. So this also greatly helped me as an educator here at UCSD. So I, I'm really grateful for all the opportunities and I would like to thank you for your support. Thanks.